Dr. Michael Haley, and this is the Dr. Haley Show podcast. Today, I'm hoping to empower the audience with a understanding of the things that are important in life and maybe with a sense of direction to achieve your goals and fulfill your purpose in life. And to help do that, today's guest, Dr. Ron Stotts, he's a three times best selling author. He's a doctor of chiropractic, he has a PhD in psychology. He's wow. studied psychology and neurology and figured out how to apply these things to leadership. And he helps executives and entrepreneurs to find higher levels of conscious leadership. Dr. Mm -hmm. Stotts, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Now, good morning to you. I know we're in completely different time zones. Uh -huh. I'm suspecting maybe you just had a chance to wake up and jump on with us. I'm doing my best, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, we're three three hours different, and it's yeah. still early over here, so I know it's early for you. There you go. I love the fact that you're a, a doctor of chiropractic, and I'm not practicing much myself anymore. I'm a doctor of chiropractic, mm -hmm. but I have, I'll say, a new mission in life. Right. And with the work that I'm doing, I'm helping people in new ways, doing something that most people don't have access to. Mm -hmm. And as a chiropractor, people would pass a hundred chiropractors on their way to me. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect it's the same for you now that there's kind of a greater fulfillment and enjoyment in the things that you're doing. Am I correct? Well, you know, the truth is I had a PhD in psychology well before the chiropractic license. And I really went back uh, to get that, to find out more about the body and the nervous system because I was using breath and movement and different, more physically oriented aspects of the of the work. And so I went back as an education. I, I met my wife in some of the earlier classes, and that's probably why I stayed through the entire program. But uh, that's you know, funny. Yeah, it really became a useful tool for me to have. I only practiced, you know, straight chiropractic for a couple of years. It gives me a better understanding of the body, the nervous system, that type of thing. I knew a lot about the neurological nervous system, but I wanted to understand how it related into the whole physiological system. So, yeah. I think you also took some principles home that were taught in chiropractic. Uh, for instance, we were taught to give for the sake of giving and all of our needs would kind of be met. I see you as that person that's really there to help as many people in life as possible. Definitely. It seems that you give a lot of it away and then, you know, those that are supposed to be customers or clients financially for you, that just mm -hmm. is something that just happens naturally because of who you are and what you do. A good example of that was something I just downloaded. It's uh, nine <laughs> insightful questions. Right. And that got my interest and I dug into it a little bit. And I thought, man, those are some real thought provoking questions that can help anyone. And I, I didn't have to pay you for that. No, <laughs> no, no. I, I really do want to, you know, educating and reaching out. My little mission that I really motivates me to go through the world is really to try and make it a more conscious and caring world. And doing that for all the kids that are coming up, just make it a better place for everybody. Before jumping into the leadership, I want to understand a little bit more about your view on plant medicine and peak performance, which is probably more of the chiropractic perspective. How do you apply those things in your life? Well, I've gone through a lot of my own journey, and so what I've really accumulated are the, the most effective tools that I can use for various situations that I run into, not only in my own life initially, but uh, in working with others. What I look for in leadership, it really comes down to leading what I would call a mindful life. Um, in other words, your higher level leaders are really nothing more than conscious leaders, more conscious than other people. They're just more aware of what they're thinking, what they're feeling emotionally or physically. They're more aware of what level of awareness I am, or am I in at this particular moment, you know, as I'm responding in this particular situation. And so when you look at their lives, they've gone through a lot. They've done a lot of inner work. They've done a lot of uh, trying to understand themselves, becoming more self-aware, if you will. And that self-awareness, of course, then extends into awareness of others and organizations and beyond. And so... The tools that I use are initially trying to 
help them neurologically rewire their brain for full integrated brain access. But to really refine that, then it gets more into mindfulness. How do you, not necessarily just meditation or things that we think of as mindfulness tools, but how do you really shift everything that you do in life, your relationships, your eating, your walking, your all of that, and if you play golf, if you whatever you do, how do you turn that into a mindfulness exercise so you're living mindfully? And the other real key component that I see for the highest level leaders are they invite them into their life, regular significant personal transformational experiences. Now, that can mean a lot of things, but it could mean somebody died in your family, somebody was born into your family, somebody, you know, it can be a natural occurrence that's just going on. But there's also those, where have you really taken the moment to look deeper into your life, to really step out of the normal flow and say, okay, today, this week, whatever it might be, I'm going to really experience a different level of consciousness. And that's where the plant medicines can come in, especially in the work. By the time they've done my initial work, they have this really in-depth foundation for self-awareness and emotional intelligence and all of that. And so when they are in the more advanced work, they're really capable of going on an inner journey where they're really, they've learned to breathe, they've learned to breathe into and accept and explore and heal whatever they come into. They've done a great job in their life and they get up to this particular level of consciousness, the plant medicine kind of takes them to another level. And so I'm always looking to introduce them to that next level of consciousness through what I'm sharing with experiences they're having, that type of thing. Yeah, we often teach our our patients are following that when it comes to the foods you eat, they have a tremendous impact on how your body and how your mind works. Yeah. If you keep a diet log, which is three columns, there's a time and date stamp, there's a what you ate, and there's a how you feel. But the how you feel, it's not just about digestion, but it's about clarity of mind, your thought processes. Are you able to receive the things that you're hearing? Do you understand? Or are you foggy and unable to follow the conversation. So I can understand why that would be so important to have a healthy, nutritious diet. Now, for some people in doing this, they might consume animal foods and have better clarity than some plant foods. Uh, Not all plant foods are healthy, wheat, grain, inflammatory foods. Mm -hmm. Um, But even in the case of animal foods, when the animals are consuming the plant foods, then those nutrients are in them that way. Mm -hmm. Um, But the point being is figuring out your nutrition, your plan, your your exercise routines, the things for that optimal performance certainly plays a role in the consciousness. So I get it. It makes sense. Very much so. I was very much, you know, I was a serious meditator from very early on and probably had 30,000 hours of meditation. And by my time I was hitting late 30s and 40s, I quit eating poultry or meat uh, at I think I was about 21 when I let go of that because I could actually feel the different energy shifts that would take place in my being, you know, through or as a result of the food. And so I just started eating much more consciously, you know, just uh, being recognizing, well, what am I putting in my mouth? Why sit for meditation for hours to, to be in a particular level of consciousness if you're going to have an anchor that's uh, <laughs> due to food or some element in your life that's holding you back. So yeah, I'm definitely a big, big supporter of that. When we talk about consciousness and then conscious leadership, how do you bring those together? How What is conscious leadership? Well, conscious leadership, really, I had worked with conscious leaders. I mean, I'd worked with owners of NFL teams, or they might have owned a hotel chain, a national hotel chain or something. You know, so I certainly worked with high level leaders in my practice, but it wasn't a focused on on just that that particular type of person. And but about oh, 10 plus years ago, my publisher really uh, recommended that I consider that. And, and she really was sharing with me that unique talent, I have quite a few abilities, but my unique talent is really taking people into that highest level of consciousness, that highest level of leadership. And, you know, when you read all the the leadership books, they they have it delineated into different levels of leadership. But, uh, and they all acknowledge that while they know how to move them up from management into more advanced leadership, they literally don't know how to take them into that highest level of leadership. 
They know the characteristics, they understand where they're coming from, but they don't know how to facilitate people moving into that. And that happens to be exactly what I've been doing for 45 years and continue to do now with a more greater focus on leaders. Okay. How can you tell when someone has reached that highest form of conscious leadership? Well, it comes out in all, I mean, you're watching it as they shift, as they become more self-aware, they become more aware of others, they become more emotionally intelligent, they become more considerate of themselves and kinder to themselves and kinder to others. I have the privilege of watching them evolve within their organizations, existing organizations oftentimes. And then you just watch them really making that organization a more trusting, safe a supportive place that's really bringing out the best in everybody. In other words, your high-level leader is really doing nothing more than bringing out the leadership within everybody else. And the irony of that is instead of having to do more, they end up having, you know, being able to do less and focus on key projects and end up actually making more money because they're they're not just micromanaging and, you know, everybody else. And so you end up with an organization that's really fully responding to their mission, really re feeling like they're part of something, that they're a valued member of something, and they really end up giving their all. And of course, that radiates into their family and into the world and makes everything a better place for everybody. As you talk about the relationships and the awareness of all the other people around you and, and your family relationships, is that what you mean by emotional intelligence or is it more to that? Well, emotional intelligence, I mean, my initial work is really helping them explore where they come from. And what that always runs into is their childhood, and that runs into their parents, and that runs into their program for getting love and looking outside of themselves for everything rather than within where most of the answers they need really are. And so emotional intelligence, I mean, it really is a matter of becoming more emotionally aware. I mean, most people kind of have certain emotions that they kind of shove down into their gut and hide in their cave. You know, one of my mentors was Joseph Campbell, and he talks about that cave within. Well, those any emotions that we felt as a child weren't acceptable in our family or in our community. We, we shoved them away or diminished them in whatever way we could. So you end up with a lot of emotional backlog of anger and hurt and fear and shame and those types of things that as a child, we didn't know how to process. So we quit breathing and shoved them out in there. We didn't feel like they were acceptable to others. And of course, then by the time we're an adult, we've got a, a good, good storage bin of emotional backlog that really consumes most of our subconscious thought. We've lost control of our life because our definition of control is really not breathing and hold, making sure we've contained all that emotional backlog rather than breathing and being fully in our power and opening up our heart and mind. So do we need to go to a psychiatrist to, you know, heal the past traumas or, or how do you deal with that? Well, I do find that all of our issues are created in relationship to other people. And so they need to be healed in relationship to other people. And I am that first other person that they can really do that with. Can it be done in relationship as a couple? You know, yeah. I used to do couples therapy for years back a long time ago. And once you help us, each of them really deal with their emotional backlog, get clear enough, then they really, as a couple, begin to live a more conscious life and support each other in ongoingly healing. And so it's kind of a combination. I, I don't think, well, I know for a fact that we can't do it on our own because we're, they're just the blind spots. You know, we, you know, I was talking to a person the other day and asked me, can't we just do it on our own? I said, well, take a breath, take another breath. Okay. Now take several breaths. And then I started having her complete certain sentences like, if I love myself unconditionally, I'm afraid other people will. Well, what? You know, and she started exploring, well, they'll think I'm arrogant or they'll think I'm, you know, 
you know, this or that or the other thing. And and she got to the same place everybody gets to. I'm afraid other people won't like me. If I'm just a little child and I'm all alone and nobody loves me, I'm going to die. So people are running around with that core belief system in there. If I'm in my power, if I love myself unconditionally, I'll die. So of course, they're never going to make that choice to love themselves unconditionally. They're never going to be in their power as long as that subconscious belief is running their life. So they've got to heal that. They've got to become aware of that, heal that, and and really reparent that little child inside so that they become a whole integrated person that's authentic and self-accepting and loving. And what I'm hearing is people are doing a good job at hiding their traumas, not revealing them. So there's a guided process to uncover the things that they've buried so well. I think most people will do anything in the world to not open that cave up and let anybody in themselves or anybody else see what's in there. Wow. And unfortunately, that keeps them in a limiting comfort zone that ends up killing them. Every time a child has a feeling that they don't know how to process and there isn't somebody there to support them in that process, they quit breathing and shove that emotion away. So a lot of times when clients come to me, they're in their 40s, 50s, 60s even, and they're experts at not breathing and and going up into their heads so that they don't have to deal with all those emotional feelings that they might be having. And so, you know, you're a chiropractor, you know that breathing is somewhat of an emotional aspect of health. <laughs> and, you know, when somebody's not breathing, they're, they're triggering their nervous system, their, you know, fight or flight system all the time. And that really shuts off the chemical gates into their higher level of thinking. And it puts them, you know, their digestive system's going to be off, their heart's going to be stressed. The, you know, the whole body is really under stress because it's, it's going on and on and on. And so... You have to really heal that to be healthy, to be truly healthy. You have to heal your emotional backlog so that you can breathe. So then you can be more emotionally aware and begin to actually maintain a lifestyle that supports you in being healthy. Yeah, it's funny because even mm -hmm. people that aren't doctors, when they see someone in stress, they say, take a breath. <laughs> Everybody intuitively knows. It. <laughs> <laughs> so there must be even a recognition that you're not breathing. Take a breath. How does that translate into breathing into success? Breathing into success is really, you know, for me, breathing is everything. I mean, it really is. It's my guide. It's my spiritual teacher. It's a, my trusted friend. You know, I, I know that if I'm breathing, I'm more present and conscious. If I'm breathing and curious, then I'm going to really see what my best next options are and make the best choices in my life. If I'm breathing and being curious, then I'm present. And if I'm breathing and being curious and present, then I'm living mindfully. And if I'm living mindfully, then I'm really doing the best I can with whatever life is bringing me. I'm making my choices consciously. I'm responding and you know, properly or not even properly, just supportively. So I'm really, you know, I call that, you know, how do you be responsible? Well, you respond appropriately to, in all levels to whatever is coming into your life. And you can only do that from a, a very present and conscious place. It's interesting as you're saying those things, I have more awareness of my own breath. And yes, I feel present in the moment, understanding and receiving and realizing this is not something I've ever practiced. And I should. Yeah, I I'm think convicted when I hear how many hours of meditation you've done and mm -hmm. how much time you've dedicated to this. So that's good. I mean, that's people good. who I've worked with 20, 30 years ago, you know, even more come, you know, I'll get emails or whatever, and they're just touching base with me. And, and they're always commenting about how the breath has changed their life and even their children's lives. And so it's, it becomes a uh, central component to really living consciously and enjoying your life fully. We are interrupting this podcast to share this month's coupon for 5% off site wide on HaleyNutrition.com. Just use the coupon code March 2024. That's M A R. CH2024 with no spaces for an extra 5% off site wide on HaleyNutrition.com now through the end of March 2024. Combine this coupon with bundle items to maximize your savings. Now, back to the show.
What's the difference between a coach and a mentor? So I think a coach, classic tradition, you think of a coach, you know, more in an athletic environment and they're kind of guiding and supporting and pointing out what you can do better. Um, you know, a mentor is going to be looking a little deeper. They're going to be, you know, supporting you and being a bit more introspective and looking at what the motivation behind, you know, a coach might say, try and get you all excited and push where a mentor is going to look what's behind you not pushing yourself or reaching for your best, yeah. you know? So yeah, being an executive coach is, I think that's more of just an adopted title because that's a comfortable name for, you know, the people that I'm working with. And some people, after they've worked with me for a while, they think of it, I think, a little embarrassing, but they, I think they, they look at me more of a spiritual teacher than they do an executive coach. And I certainly don't claim that title by any stretch, but, uh, Oh, well, yeah. there's obviously some spiritual coaching, some coaching, some mentorship, some yeah. spiritual yeah. guidance. I guess it's all kind of intertwined in one yeah. way or another. Uh, you've had some mentors along the way, though. And yeah. you mentioned one who I'm not familiar with. But I am sure. curious, what are some of the things that maybe you learned from your mentors that had an impact on your life that you can think of clearly today? Well, Joseph Campbell, he he did the whole hero's journey. The whole Star Wars thing is ba based on Joseph's work. And uh, so he really talked about that cave within. He's famous for his quote of, you know, you've got to go to that. I will never say it correctly, but, you know, you have to go to that, open that cave within to find the treasure that you seek. And, of course, that treasure that you're seeking that everybody wants is that unconditional love that they wanted as a child. They're always still seeking that even as an adult. And the only place you can find that is, is within yourself. And, you know, it's through healing that emotional past. It's through self-accepting all the different parts of yourself. So you become whole. So Joseph certainly affected that because that's really the core of everything that I do. You know, I've validated that truth many, many times. Yeah. Um, Buckminster Fuller, he's a fellow who created the geodesic dome and quite, he was quite a thought leader back in the 70s and 80s, I think it was. And I remember being on stage with him and uh, just helping him with, you know, large audience in front of us. I was 27, he was 87. So I was much more aware of, you know, the audience than he was, you know, in terms of conscious, you know, concerns. And we, he was talking and all of a sudden he stopped and he kind of looked up. And he just sort of held that posture for an extended period of time, you know, for this 27-year-old kid next to him. He's going like, hello, <laughs> let's, why aren't, there's 200 people out there waiting for you to say something, let's go. And uh, that evening, we were having some hot chocolate in front of the fire, and they was bold enough to go, uh, Bucky, what, what, what was going on there? He goes, oh, I was just accessing information. <clears throat> and I was like, what? <laughs> you know, 27, I'm not, you know. But he was very interested in my meditation at the time, which I was fully into. And he said, so you're really good at stopping thought. When you get to that place where you can stop thought, you can also extend out and request information. You can not really from something else, but from all of who and what you truly are. And I call that accessing big mind. And that's really what I end up introducing people to in the more advanced work is because as a, as an advanced leader, high conscious leader, <clears throat> you really have to have a mind that's so agile that it can deal with all the complexities and depths of rapid change that's going on in the business world today. And so you can't really be going, okay, well, what did we do five years ago? What should we done? Or what did other people do? Or, you know, you have to really be present enough to access the best of, of who and what you are. And that's, that's big mind. In other words, um, really, <clears throat> really trusting that by going up in your head and trying to figure out the answer is not going to give you the best of what's available. It's by, you know, letting go and, and just putting it out there, what you need and watching it come in, you know, and I do it all the time in my work and, I have a little side gig that I 
don't do much anymore, but uh, I love to build Japanese gardens. And so it's, you know, it's a matter of, I remember this one fellow, the CEO in, in San Francisco that I was working with found out I did that and he wanted me to build one for his wife. And this was during the dot-com period. And, you know, so everything had to be bigger, better, more money, that type of thing. And uh, so he wanted this million dollar garden. And I was like, you know, I'm running my practice and I'm working with clients, so I don't have time to, you know, do extensive drawings and all of that. So I went up on my, you know, hill behind my house in Mill Valley and uh, just sat, went into a quiet place and put out there, yes, I want to create this Japanese garden. It's for these people and I want to impact their life in a way that allows them to be more conscious and loving and... uh, so I sat there and I just watched this beautiful image of this garden come in, you know, initially with the big waterfall and the large pond and the bamboo forest and all of these different components coming in. But then even the minute details of the wind blowing and the sounds and the movement and the smells and, and within an hour and a half, it was the most beautiful garden I'd ever seen was there. And three months later, I'd built it and we won all sorts of international awards and for design and uh, technology. And, uh, you know, I couldn't have done that. You know, I we didn't have time to be running around making drawings and that. So I never did make any drawings. I just walked them through the space and drew it in their mind as I described it. So, so That's big pretty mind, interesting. You know, comes from that. Yeah. Because it flies in the face of the things I've been taught. You know, you have to document and plan and and write down your goals and have everything. But you sat and you created a picture and you made it a complete picture. So what else is there when that picture is complete, making it a reality? And then you just got to work to get it done. (laughs) Skipping all the drawings. That's interesting. You know, a client who's he's got five, nine-figure business, a very successful guy. One of his companies is Modular Homes, and he wanted to be able to deliver them on a truck. And so he needed a hinge, you know, to be able to open and close these two sections together. And, uh, you know, and he's not an engineer. He's, you know, a creative guy, really bright. But, uh, you know, so all he did was do that he just sat quietly and imagined the hinge that he needed and within a half hour it had come through and they drew it out and you know it was really a brilliant hinge i i've never seen anything like it before in my life and i'm pretty you know aware of what's going on out there in, in mechanical things and uh, you know so people use it in a lot of different ways you know business decisions practical design answers to how to deal with particular situations maybe with employees or whatever and yeah it's just that answer comes in that's going to be optimal for everybody that's involved and that's because fact you could really apply it to anything from how i want my relationship with my wife and my children to be and you know what i want to see my business evolve into i I mean it's endless taking the moment to get quiet create that image you can't imagine doing it any other way you're just limiting yourself if you're trying and efforting you know if you're doing a math problem that's one thing but you know even if you don't if say you're doing a math problem and you know you don't know the answer you can still big big mind an answer and there's a good chance that it'll be right (laughs) and people love to play with that one (laughs) yeah The other thing that I thought was really neat was the example you had given where the speaker had paused and maybe it was awkward. And I'm accessing what could be the most important thing to benefit the audience. There'd be nothing wrong with that. It would be worth the wait. And that pause can even create more impact with what you're going to. They'll be more present and listening more carefully when you do speak. It's interesting. I like it because we think that we have to just keep on moving along and entertain everybody. So I like that. I know I've done that in seeing patients. You just don't have the answer yet, but give me a moment here. And then, you know, I have a question for you. And you start leading down a path and it's like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Yeah. You know, I do it. My clients, you know, I see most of them in person, but I also do the Zoom chats with them. And I think most of the time, all I'm really doing is giving them a bigger perspective or a higher, more conscious perspective on whatever they're challenged by. And that comes big mind. I don't, you know, I don't think about it. 
Yeah, the other day, I, that's that's not true. The other day, I, a client was really dealing with some odd reactions in in his work environment, and it just it, things weren't working for him. And so I just took a moment. I said, "Just give me a moment." I, I not that I don't know what to say or how to say it. I just need to, and I just all of a sudden this question came to me, and it was the perfect question. You know, why don't you want to grow up? And of course, he just went. It was like hitting like a bolt. You know? I mean, this is a fifty-seven-year-old guy, <laughs> but he he saw that. Oh, underneath it all, that little boy is still, you know, looking for attention, and that's really what was being played out in his work. Mm. And so, it immediately gave him the wherewithal to be able to look at it and heal it and move forward. Okay. So, yeah, very empowering stuff. And I thought you were going a different direction with it because when I have a problem or a challenge, I always like to say, what can I learn from this? Mm -hmm. And how can I do it better or prevent that in the future? Mm -hmm. So I thought you were going more in that direction. Why don't you want to grow up? Why don't you want to learn it from this? But you were going back to him covering something up. Yeah, in that particular case. And, and I think your direction is just as viable. Particular situation didn't go that way, but that... That's just as viable to, you know, what looking at going moving forward, as you say. What what's your favorite story or testimonial from someone that you've been able to, you know, take them to the next level of higher consciousness and it, it was life transforming for them? I'm sure it all is every time for everyone. What's one of your favorite stories? I am somewhat of a transformational coach, so a transformational guide, I would call it. Just before COVID, a fellow came to me and a uh, very successful guy. The woman he had, his love of his life, had recommended. I had worked with her a few years before that, and she had recommended that he come to me. And, and they had split up. And so, and with COVID and everything else, he, he was really in a, felt like his whole life was falling apart. And it potentially was if it kept going the direction that he was going in. And and I live on an island up by Seattle, and uh, he came up and rented a cabin on the island, and we did all the COVID prevention stuff for, you know, a couple of weeks. And then, you know, he wasn't seeing anybody else, and I certainly wasn't either. So we were getting together a couple times a week. And, uh, you know, this guy went from, I think his first question to me was, and what's this love stuff? I don't love myself and I'm doing fine. So, I mean, I, I was like, oh God, am I in the wrong room? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I found him within a month, having fallen in love with himself, restructuring his organizations, his leadership within the organizations. And I mean, within a year, he had more than doubled the value of several of his organizations. Mm -hmm. And these are high values. <laughs> And within a few months, his relationship was back together and they were getting married and they wow. were asking me to marry them. And uh, his relationship with his family, you know, his kids and that type of thing, which he hadn't even mentioned, you know, was all of a sudden shifting dramatically and getting better and better. And so, you know, just everything in his life got better. You know, he sent me quite a few of his C-suites and they really all did quite well with the work and they began taking over the organizations he had multiple organizations and so he ends up, ends up really not even bothering most of these people running his organizations where they would have been talking to him every day you know he ended up you know sometimes months would go by before they you know talked to him again but he started working on one aspect of one of his organizations that he was really passionate about and of course, this is a very smart, creative guy. That one little tiny part of that one business that would have been, you know, not even considered before became the most valuable part. And he's going to make more money with that than he will with any and all of everything else that he's doing. And that's all the research shows that these people who become more conscious leaders end up making more money. Being the organizations are much more productive and much more profitable. And that makes sense because they're in alignment with their life and their higher intention. They bring all their people in alignment with their own lives and the organization's intention. And all of a sudden you have all the energy moving towards that, uh, that 
aspiration uh, that higher intention of the of the people involved and of course that's going to result in greater success I've got some questions because you've mentioned it a couple of times, the word love, you know, vitamin L, as it applies to loving yourself. I've never heard it phrased the way you just did, where you said he ended up falling in love with himself. You also use the word unconditional love as opposed to, well, there's love and there's unconditional love. What's unconditional love as opposed to just loving yourself? Um, I've always saw, saw it as a, almost like a conscious decision is unconditional love. Despite these things, I still choose to love and care for or be generous to or whatever the case is. But in that, you're not actually falling in love. Help me understand, because it seems to be an important key. I've been a parent. I've got grandchildren, and you know, so I get to watch the the ages go through. Parents always say, "Oh, I love my child unconditionally." Well, not really, <laughs> because if you don't love yourself unconditionally, you're not able to give unconditional love. You watch most parents, and they're training their child with the best of intentions most times to be the person they they feel like they need to be to make get in the world and to be successful and to, you know, to, to take care of themselves. But, you know, the truth is that that love is very, un, very conditional, you know, say, say your dad doesn't like, you know, as, as a kid, when I was growing up, boys weren't supposed to be afraid, you know, and in my family, we weren't supposed to show anger. So here I am at, you know, I must have been in my late 20s before I ran into the reality of, oh, I don't know how to show anger or, or fear. <laughs> you know? And that those were huge components that I had been buried in my life and were holding me back because I wasn't connected to them. Did my parents love me? They're the greatest parents I could have had. Did they love me unconditionally? No, they didn't know how. They wouldn't have even known how to love themselves unconditionally. They didn't, weren't capable of it. They had difficult childhoods and you know, they were still in, you know, by the time they had me, they were still kids in, in lots of ways. And so when you really look at a child who wants unconditional love more than anything else, what they're looking for, they'll do what, anything they need to to get that. And they're looking to their parents of like, well, what, who do I need to be? What do I do with these feelings or those feelings? What do I do in terms of self, you know, reflection or, or whatever? They, they, the parents really mold the children to become the, you know, the most lovable person they can for the parents. You know, I'm working with people all over the world, from India and Africa and, you know, just, and, you know, those parents have, you know, you've got to get an education, you've got to do this, you've got to be like this. You've... And so the p children are like, okay, I fit into your mold, but now in their 40s, they're going, well, yeah, but who am I? And so loving yourself unconditionally really comes as a result of going into and healing that inner child. And really all those disparate parts that you discarded to be accepted and loved by your parents, family, and others, um, you, you nurture your relationship with them, you reconnect with them, you really learn to accept and love all of them. Even those parts that you shoved so far in there that you hope nobody would ever see it because you felt wasn't acceptable to yourself and others. You've got to go in there and, and learn to accept all aspects of yourself. And that's the journey of becoming whole. That's the journey of accepting and loving yourself. And at some point, you've graduated to a point where the, at least the most significant points or aspects of yourself have have been reintegrated and you're are a part of who you are. You know, I can be a very silly little boy whenever I wish, ask my wife. <laughs> but I can also be a very spiritual being. I can also be a jock. I can also I can be all of these different parts of who and what I am. And uh, with now, you know, I'm not worried about what other people think because I'm not looking outside of myself any longer for that unconditional love I want. I'm looking within and accepting and loving myself. That's the difference. That's a whole different life. Yeah. And that final summary of that really makes a lot of sense to me, brings a lot of clarity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What's your day look like today? What are you going to do uh, to love yourself? <laughs> Well, I'm already doing it in lots of ways, to be honest with you. You know, I get up and get all cleaned up and, I, you know, I take care of myself. 
going to have a I haven't had breakfast yet and so I'm going to have a nice breakfast that I really enjoy and I'm going to have a conversation with my wife about something we always do in the morning and what's her day like what am I doing I'm going to hit a bucket of golf balls into a net that I have in the yard and just hone my game more mindfully I'm probably going to work in the yard a little bit either go for a walk with my wife or I do some little project in the yard that I enjoy but most of the day is I'm working with clients uh, on video chat today and uh, video zoom today and uh, and that to me you know at this point I certainly a lot of people say aren't you retired yet and it's like I don't have any plans to retire i absolutely love what I do and you know so it's a privilege yeah you know, it's a privilege to get to talk with you about this it's a privilege to get to talk with my clients and you know when you when you're not just giving people information but you're really helping them in through their transformation there's nothing for me anyway that's more rewarding than doing that I'm giving the best of who and what I am and I'm living as consciously as I can and that's my choice it was neat as you answered that question on all points, there was a joy and a smile as you said those things that you're going to do that you enjoy doing. Uh, yeah. So that's beautiful. And there's a lesson in that. Do yeah. what you love. That's <laughs> part of loving yourself. Absolutely. I know the answer to this question. Where can people go to find out more about you? And to make it really easy, there's going to be a link below the video on the YouTube page, on the blog post. I want to especially link to this questionnaire. I'm going to put a specific link to the nine insightful questions, uh, because I really think that it's a great starting point for anyone mm -hmm. to yeah. really think about where they are, where they want to be, and how they're going to get there. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So. That's, you know, just it begins that inner journey when they when they start asking questions. If you're breathing and asking questions, you're you've begun the inner journey. And the deeper you want to go, that's where people come and go, okay, I'm ready to go deeper and I need some help. And I go, great, let's go. <laughs> Dr. And if Stotts. somebody wants to talk to me, they're welcome to, and they can schedule a call and we can chat about whatever they're working on and going through. Man, what a joy for me to spend time with you today. I That's seriously fine, thank you, um, love and appreciate you. You are awesome. Thanks. I appreciate that. Appreciate what you're doing out there. 